Uh, hi, uh, hello, and welcome to another uh, round of uh, Raisina Fireside Chats, uh, which we have titled Bites and Bullets, the Future of Defense Technology and Innovation. And I have with me uh, Sri Vivek Lal, who is uh, Chief Executive, General Atomics uh, uh, Global Corporation, U.S. Vivek, welcome to this chat. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, uh, Vivek, when we talk of defense technology today and we, we look at the defense landscape, it is inextricably mixed with the larger geopolitical trends. So when you, when you see the technological, defense technological future, what are the fundamentals uh, in your view in terms of geopolitics? How is that transforming our ability to comprehend defense innovation, defense technology, and the future of warfare? Right, so uh, that's an excellent question. I think what is happening is you have two types of technology streams. One is evolutionary, the other is revolutionary. And in the evolutionary space, you know, you have technologies that have been incubated for a long time, but you keep chipping away at improvements. Um, and as you do that, we're, we're seeing tech trends that are coming in that are improving the cycle time for coming up with the next version, if you will. And uh, that in itself provides great gains in the evolutionary piece. Um, now the revolutionary is, of course, things that you know um, did not exist five years ago, but now are possible. As an example, the connectivity speeds have gone significantly higher, and so to be able to um, uh, track that, manage that, and therefore create new products to um, uh, to take advantage of those types of technologies. So whether you talk about artificial intelligence, machine learning, synthetic biology, uh, quantum cryptography, all those are revolutionary in a way because they enable uh, new products and services out there, uh, not only in the military domain but in the commercial domain as well. Um, and so as you look at these streams continue, five years from now we may be talking about other things that we are not even aware of. and. Uh, in the geopolitical sphere, what I feel is that, um, yes, there is a, a need for strategic independence has been talked about. However, I would call it uh, interdependent independence. So where countries have to you know, collaborate to a certain amount without having to reinvent the wheel on certain technologies that require lots of dollars of investment, and yet be able to uh, take advantage of the gains internally in their own countries. And so there are several examples of how that's playing out, but I think that's what the desire is in, in the long term. And, and the one point I'd like to make about revolutionary um, changes is that it uh, has to be a fail fast model. In other words, you try different things and you fail quickly because uh, time is of the essence much more now than it was even a decade ago uh, because technological changes are coming up so fast. Yes, in fact, you know, there, there was a time when in early 1990s the, the term uh, RMA got introduced. Now you look at the speed and scale of change. It's so right. fast that you have to uh, either think of a new term or you say, R, you know, RMA 2.2 or 3.2, it just completely right. uh, it, it has changed the landscape. Uh, but when, you, know, you, you touched upon the, the geopolitical aspect, and, and what we are looking at today is an intense competition uh, among major powers, among ideological contenders, um, among different coalitions, and it, it certainly, um, you know, there was, a, there was China in, in the Indo-Pacific, there is now Russian war in Ukraine, which has sort of consolidated those coalitions. So is this trend going to affect the way we think about defense cooperation, defense uh, technological evolution, uh, we have seen, for example, in the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, AUKUS, you know, Australia, UK, US uh, alliance or, or, or a security arrangement for developing certain kinds of technologies in, in the region. So is this going to be the norm now that, uh, that partners are going to come together and develop defense technologies? I think so. I think there is a silver lining in some of the things that are happening from uh, R&D and innovation standpoint. I think there'll be more collaborative R&D, there'll be more melding of the minds across geographies where there is a uh, common purpose. Uh, as an example, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, and having a common operating picture will be very critical in the um, days and years ahead. 
because uh, as we can see how the geopolitics is playing out, it's very important to maintain that situational awareness picture. Um, and so I do feel overall there'll be more uh, emphasis on higher spend for R&D. Uh, there'll be more emphasis for innovative technologies. I think, uh, and everything comes at a cost, so I think the partnerships will allow for bringing the cost parameter as a design parameter into the equation as well and, and lower the cost. And so we seen, we've seen that between countries, for example, between US and India, that there are technologies at the bleeding edge uh, that are in India or in the US and collaborations that uh, happen as a result. Uh, the other piece as a result I think we'll see is a greater number of startup companies mm -hmm. come up. And uh, these startups, as, as we've seen in India so successfully, are actually doing great work that um, uh, are, you know, world class. And it's really uh, creditable that the Indian government has incubated that. And, and we can see a lot of benefit as a result of that, um, not only in India, but for the world. Yes, it's been, uh, I think, uh, an incredible story of, of, of how this landscape has changed. And since you mentioned um, uh, India, India, US, uh, you know, let's come to the, let's come to that. There has been uh, a lot of debate in, in India, and, and a lot of uh, you know, if you look at the trajectory of India, US defense relationship, a remarkable one, um, you know, from um, as as they used to say, democracies, you know, th that that are they were looking the other way. To, you know, now you have. Uh, democracies that are almost convergent on, on the larger issues of our times. Now, uh, when we, when you look at it from a defense innovation, defense technology cooperation perspective, uh, how, how, you know, in, in your uh, experience, you have seen this landscape transformed, and what are the opportunities here that that await that still await us? That is still we have to harness that potential. Right. So, uh, as you very rightly said, the U.S.-India relationship has come leaps and bounds ahead in, in terms of defense, all the um, bilateral agreements that have been put in place, and indeed the business to business ties. And what's very encouraging is that it's not just the large companies getting together from both sides, but it's the small medium enterprises also engaging in the uh, supply chains in both countries. Uh, you see joint ventures, you see collaborations of the larger companies but also their supply chains that are now marrying up with each other. And uh, you know, when we talk about supply chain resilience and to be able to uh, manage through crises like we're seeing for that the geopolitics show uh, can, can manifest itself, it is very important to be able to diversify those supply chains and, and have those um, you know, pockets of excellence in both countries. And, that has started to build up, uh, I would say, in the last few years. And uh, add to that the dimension of startup companies. Um, and startups not just in um, India, but as well as in the US. And the, and the, and the uh, amount of synergies in the corporate boardrooms um, to see a common goal. Because ultimately, all the government policies that have been rightly put in place to facilitate this have to end up in business-to-business, uh, -business, um, uh, you know, common platforms or services. And we're seeing that. We're seeing the beginnings of that. And I think going forward, there's tremendous potential for co-development, uh, co-production. And then an important aspect is after sales support. So once a platform goes into one country, uh, you would want to retain the independence of making sure that platform remains in the country so it can be serviced from a maintenance perspective, from a repair perspective, and an overhaul perspective, so that there doesn't have to be this situation where the platform needs to move back to the country of origin for, for these types of issues. And so, uh, and as you know, um, the acquisition cost is only, the, the initial cost of the platform is just a very small fraction of the overall cost of maintaining and repairing and overhauling over a lifetime of 30, 40, 50 years. And so I see a lot of innovation possible there. I see a lot of development possi possible there, a lot of indigenization possible in that whole MRO space. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, there, there used to be a lot of um, concern, uh, at least in some quarters in India, about, uh, you know, moving away from the buyer-seller uh, relationship to one where, uh, as, you, as you're mentioning, co-production, co-development. Technology transfer, for example, is a large part of, of uh, what India is looking for. Uh, you know, looking at it from where you are uh, in the U.S., does it worry you that the India's emphasis on self-reliance, uh, do you think that's going to be a constraint, or, or can it be an enabler in the kind of a relationship that the two countries are seeking? Right, excellent question, and I personally feel it's an enabler. It, it opens up various avenues of cooperation and collaboration, and it benefits, I think, both countries, because, again, uh, nothing stands still. Technology keeps improving, and the cycle time for technology to improve is shortening. And so to come up with the latest and best in, in any aspect, to be able to um, create that uh, in India, for example, uh, the next um, technology leap that comes from India will just benefit both countries. And so I, I do think that um, it's a positive. I do think it that, and I think uh, that innovation with, and that cost point, the price point, uh, and some of the inherent advantages of human resources and things of that nature lend itself well to India flourishing in this uh, endeavor. And I do think um, American companies and, uh, um, and the entire American ecosystem will see benefits when this thing uh, plays out. And so uh, if, if you are to uh, look at the trajectory and, and if you are to look at uh, you know, a few things that, that the two nations still need to do uh, to take this uh, defense engagement forward, what would you be recommending, uh, given that already we have come a long way, but uh, you know, given the, the priorities and given the rapidly changing, evolving uh, geopolitical dynamic, uh, would you make some recommendations as to where, where the two policymakers in the two nations would, should be looking at? Yes, I would uh, strongly suggest uh, continued focus and increase in R&D. Um, and I think uh, academic institutions have a big role to play in that. I think think tanks have a big role to play in that. Uh, I think uh, national labs and national institutions of research and development have a big role. And, and in addition to all of that, I think private sector R&D is, is very critical. And I think because that's where you will stay ahead, not just for the current platforms or even the platforms I've envisioned five or ten years from now, but I'm talking from a, a long-term standpoint so that you don't just have products that are um, made in the country, but actually you're developing products for the future, that, uh, and, and that will only happen um, with an increased focus of R&D, not just in governmental institutions, but also indeed in the private sector. And so if I were to pick out one area that I think can see vast improvements in, in focus uh, and, and going not just to um, the applications, but even the basic sciences, so materials, um, uh, for example, advanced materials, et cetera. These are all the areas that can use a lot of further research and development in, in the future. So thank you, Vivek. Thank you for being with us here today and uh, for being at the Raisina Dialogue. And uh, here is hoping that India-US defense relationship uh, continues to grow strong. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much.